Penny Wong, welcome to Insiders. Good to be with you, Patricia. Would Labor have signed up to this plan uh, requested by the Pacific nations to obligate Australia to end coal mining and go carbon neutral by 2050? Well, I tell you what, we would have entered, were we in government, those negotiations with much more credibility on climate than the government. And the problem is, what we have here is a Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, who's been throwing, throwing his weight around, who's being pushy, uh, and if the reports from other leaders about what went on there are correct. This, uh, this Prime Minister has presided over uh, a reduction in Australia's influence in the Pacific and he's damaged our relationships. Now, uh, let's understand what the coalition went in, in terms of, with in terms of their credibility on climate. Into a forum with a whole uh, range of leaders from nations for whom climate change is an existential threat. Uh, he went in with emissions rising, without a plan to reduce emissions, uh, with a history of people like Peter Dutton making jokes about Pacific Island nations sinking underwater. And of course Michael McCormack saying climate change was fine, they'd be fine because they could come here and pick fruit. Is it any wonder uh, that he walked out of that having alienated okay. people that we want to be close to? But what they were calling for, what they were demanding Australia sign up to, is actually at odds with Labor's own policies, particularly Labor's post-election policy on coal. Sure. You've got Joel Fitzgibbon, who's the co-chair now of a Friends of Exporting Coal group. Uh, Patricia, they were calling for a number of things. They were calling for us to uh, actually sign up to targets which were consistent with the Paris Agreement. We should do that. We should raise our ambitions. Uh, secondly, they were calling on Australia to actually reduce its emissions. They're going up under this government because they have no plan. And thirdly, they were asking us not to use an accounting trick to meet our weak targets, that is the Kyoto carryover credits. We should do that. And they were asking for action on coal. Now, coal is an important industry for Australia. So you wouldn't it's have signed up to shutting uh, it down either? Oh, of course not. I mean, we, 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 coal remains a, a, an important industry for Australia and it remains part of the global energy mix. But the point is, uh, these negotiations proceeded uh, on the basis of uh, an Australian government that did not understand nor respect the importance uh, of climate to Pacific Island nations okay. and did not bring to the table any realistic policies to reduce emissions, which is the core of what we should be doing as a responsible nation. Uh, they were also, some of those nations, pushing for uh, a limitation of warming below 1.5%. Would you have signed up to that? Oh, well, when I was Climate Minister many years ago, we talked about that. Uh, goal and aspiration. I mean, I, I think the sad reality is uh, that where we are as a global community, uh, you know, we're in a much worse position than we were 10 years ago. But we should try... Uh, I, I want to emphasise this. These nation states are at the front line of climate change. You can't walk into a room with the sort of history that Scott Morrison has, with the sort of uh, refusal to act on climate, uh, and then throw your weight around and expect it to work out well. And that the problem for Australia is this is our front yard, this is our neighbourhood, These are, this is where we want to be the partner of choice. And instead, we have a Prime Minister who... OK. If but you look at what leaders have said, Patricia, it's not me, it's Pacific Island leaders. He has alienated far too many uh, leaders at a time we need to be closer. You say this outcome damages our Pacific step up. Describe to me how it damages it and what you fear will happen now. Well, <laughs> I think that's self-evident. I mean, when you have Pacific Island leaders making the sorts of comments uh, that they've made, uh, it is clear that we, we may have put additional resources into the Pacific, although I'd make the point that the $500 million is taken from other programs, so it's just reallocated, not new money. Uh, and you get an outcome where you have Pacific Island leaders really publicly uh, talking about how Australia has let them down. That's a problem for us. OK. Uh, and it's a failure of Australia. It's a massive failure of Australian foreign policy. China has told Pacific nations it recognises the mm. legitimate demands of small island states for tackling climate change. Has China seized the opportunity here? Well, China will do what China will do. Wh and what uh, is that? And, uh, well, uh, China will press for its interests and China will uh, seek to continue uh, to expand its influence uh, in the region. I mean, that that's what they've said, that's what they will do. And do you and we think have now to they will we, exploit we, we, this? We have to recognise uh, that the Pacific Island nations have a right 
uh, can choose who they choose to, to work with. What we must do is we want to work to be the partner of choice. Uh, and we should be for historic and uh, cool and geographic reasons. And are and you saying we're not is, the partner of choice now? Well, I, I don't think what the Prime Minister, how, how Mr Morrison behaved, uh, nor frankly how a number of ministers have behaved over a number of years, uh, help us be the partner of choice. I think we have diminished our influence in the Pacific with our refusal uh, to take climate change seriously. I mean, these are leaders for whom this is the most important strategic uh, threat. It's the most important uh, threat to the livelihood and well-being of the people of the Pacific. That's their words. So and, are you and we're not responding. So are you suggesting we've pushed these nations into the arms of China? Uh, I'm suggesting uh, that we should make sure we are the partner of choice. That was the whole logic behind the Pacific Step Up, which we called for, which Labor called for. Uh, and at the moment, uh, what we've seen is a Prime Minister who's uh, really, I think, failed to discharge his responsibilities when it comes to Australia being uh, the partner of choice in the Pacific. And it's do, important for us. And do you fear China will exploit this opportunity? I, I'm not sure fear is the word. I mean, I think uh, I've said to you, China will do what China will do. China will continue in our region, uh, in the Pacific, uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, will continue to uh, assert its interests. Uh, they've made that clear. Uh, that's what uh, great powers do and we need to continue to assert ours. We need to continue to uh, be the partner of choice in the Pacific and that's taken a big hit at the moment with the Prime Minister's behaviour, Mr Morrison's behaviour. Uh, and we need to continue to work for what sort of region we want. On China, Simon Birmingham was on Insiders just last week and he set up a sort of threshold or a test, if you like, for speaking out on China, whether it's in our national interest. And that was in response, of course, to Andrew Hastie, the Liberal MP's comments. Is that a test that you think should be met by all MPs? How should we progress on this conversation about the rise of China? Well, it's time for the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister to lead a calm and mature discussion on China. I mean, we have backbenchers uh, out there uh, making a whole range of comments. Uh, I think it would be far better at a time where it is a, a complex relationship and getting more so, that we have a mature, sensible and calm discussion uh, on our relationship with China and how we make it work for us. And that should be led by the government. It, it shouldn't be led uh, by backbenchers. And the fact that backbenchers are feeling a need to, to lead it is, I think, a demonstration of the failure of the government to do so. I think Andrew Hastie talked about the intellectual failure uh, of the current discussion. And I think that's a failure of the Morrison government. Now, what I will be doing is writing to Maurice Payne, the foreign minister, and requesting that parliamentarians get access to briefings about the relationship on China uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Office of, of National Intelligence because I think we are at a point where the relationship is more complex, uh, also more consequential, it matters to us, and we should have a much more sensible and mature discussion about how we make it work for us. OK, so you want these briefings to be provided to what, all MPs who request them. Where do the briefings lead? The government what, will articulate its current position. We know what that position is. And what do you want to happen as a result? Well, well, I think we should have a more informed debate. I think we, we have a debate at the moment where Liberal backbenchers or, or, back, or, or other parliamentarians feel a need, because of the leadership vacuum on this issue, to make a whole range of comments. Some of them I agree with, some of them I don't, some of them I think are inflammatory. Uh, but I think we, we do have uh, a national interest in managing this relationship uh, uh, in a way that works for Australia, and that re requires uh, a great deal more maturity, calm uh, and sense than we've seen. It requires much more leadership from Mr Morrison and, and Senator Payne. If you remove the Nazi or the rise of Nazi Germany reference from Andrew Hastie's comments, do you have sympathy for the broader message he was sending? Well, but th this is actually my point. Andrew Hastie shouldn't be the template in which we discuss, against which we discuss our China relationship. Uh, that's exactly the point I'm making. Like, there are some aspects of what he said which may be valid. There are some aspects I think were inflammatory, the, obviously the one to which you refer. But Andrew Hastie uh, and other backbenchers shouldn't be the ones defining the discussion about China. That should be a matter for political leaders. Uh, and unfortunately, we've seen a real vacuum when it comes to Scott Morrison and Senator Payne on this, and I think that has to change. We need to work out how we make the relationship work for us. We need to work out how we we make it work for us, knowing China will press for its interests as we should press for ours, and also knowing that we should always stand 
for who we are. We should protect our sovereignty and assert our values uh, and assert the strength of our democracy. And should we be asserting also to Pacific leaders that China's emissions are also an issue? This has been raised by Winston Peters, the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand this week. Do you think that's a relevant point here? Oh, look, I think all countries uh, credibility on climate will matter to the Pacific. Including China's? That, because oh, it course, seems the scrutiny is on us. Uh, well, China is including in all countries, yeah. I think. But yes, I do. But uh, I, I do again say, rather than saying getting into really a, a quite a, um, you know, a, an unhelpful debate about who's better, why don't we just try and be better? Why don't we just try and do the right thing? And why don't we try and treat Pacific Island nations with a little more respect than they've been shown? I mean, I, I don't think it will take us a long time to get over some of the disrespect that Peter Dutton's comments and also Michael McCormack's comments and add to them a range of others uh, have uh, the, the, the effect of those comments in the Pacific. How concerned are you on the crackdown on protesters in Hong Kong? Mm. Uh, well, I'm, I've made public statements about this. I'm deeply concerned. Uh, uh, what we would say is, I would make a few points. Uh, we support, Australia supports a right to a peaceful protest. Uh, I emphasise peaceful, we don't condone violence. We'd urge the authorities to exercise maximum uh, restraint and we would urge all parties to find a peaceful resolution that is consistent with the one country, two systems promise which was made to the people of Hong Kong. Are you satisfied by the comments made by the Prime Minister and the Australian Government or do you want them to go further in supporting the protest movement? Oh, look, they have made public comments uh, uh, and I understand that there are also, uh, there would also, I assume, be private uh, diplomatic uh, representations being made and that's as it should be. OK, so you don't expect them to go further than they have? Well, I, I think each day we see uh, a, a new uh, set of images, a new set of propositions out of Hong Kong and the government should continue to do what I think it is seeking to do, which is to assert uh, Australian interests and Australian values. I mean, what, matters, what happens in Hong Kong matters to us. It matters to the world. Uh, we have a particular interest. Obviously, we have a lot of Australians in Hong Kong. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would encourage, as I've always encouraged every time I've done media on this, people to ensure they keep themselves uh, briefed and advised by, by a smart traveller. And how about the ugly scenes we've seen? We've seen uh, protests here where there have been uh, conflicts on our streets and also on university campuses being raised today actually by a couple of Liberal MPs as well that universities need to do more to deal with this. What are your reflections on this? Well this actually goes back to what I was saying that rather than having backbenchers raise these issues let's have a, a, a sensible mature discussion uh, about the relationship with China and this is an aspect of it. I would make this point. We in Australia do support freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and we also, as I said, support a right to peaceful protest, so, you know, freedom of assembly. We would expect that people in Australia uh, are entitled to exercise those rights if they do so respectfully and peacefully and that they are free from intimidation. And we would expect any person in Australia, citizen or not, to respect those rights. Just before I let you go, are you going to uh, stay in the Senate for your full term? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you're going to live out the whole term, stay in well, the Well, actually, parliament? I think I, I, I'll be seeking pre-selection again because uh, that's before the next election. So. OK, and you will seek pre-selection again? You want to stay in the parliament? Yes, I do. Just wanted to clarify. Senator <laughs> Penny Wong, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good to speak with you.